the Gospel according to Matthew, verse 1, wherein we read, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. The genealogy or the history of Jesus Christ, his ancestral line, his lineage, those that came before him, those that God chose to bring forth the Messiah, the family we read about here. In the book of Hebrews, we read the Messiah speaking of the volume of the book, and that speaks of the Old Testament scriptures, the Tanakh, of the volume of the book. In all of the scriptures, it is written of me, the Messiah declares. The prophets foretold of one who would lead God's people into God's light. One who would intercede on their behalf and bear their sins that they might have life. God had determined long before he ever created Adam the first man. God had determined how he would save the race that would fall in Adam. He had determined it. He had purposed it. He had decreed it. And the prophets spoke of the one who would come, who would accomplish God's plan of salvation. And even in this ancestral line of Jesus, who was called the Christ, we are pointed to men who in some measure give witness to the character and to the mission of the Messiah himself. Their lives, things that happened in their lives, they were prophetic. They point us to the Christ. I think about when Jesus was walking with those men who were on the road to Emmaus on Easter Sunday morning, and yet the identity of who it was that walked with them, the identity of Jesus Christ was withheld from their eyes. God did not let them know that it was Jesus who walked with them. And so they walked in despair. And they told this glorious stranger, Hey, where have you been? You don't know what's going on? Because he was asking, hey, what's the matter? Why are you guys so down? And they're all, don't you read the news? Don't, don't you know what's happening? How can you be anywhere near Jerusalem and not know the things that have taken place? And Jesus looks at them. Well, what things? Well, tell me what's going on. Tell me what happened. And so they tell Jesus what had happened to Jesus? <laughs> they, they tell how they had hoped that he was the Messiah. And yet three days ago, he was crucified. Oh, slow of heart to hear and understand all, all that the prophets had foretold. And he goes through the entire Old Testament with them. What a walk. That must have been. They didn't know it was Jesus at the time, but this, this mysterious man just begins to tell them all of the scriptures that spoke concerning him. And we see in the scripture that God uses pictures, God uses types, and I am sure that as Jesus walked down that road, he revealed to them the various prophetic types pointing to the character and the person and the ministry and the mission of the Messiah. Jesus spoke concerning himself and he showed them how indeed of the volume of the book it's all written about me. And so last week we looked at Isaiah, excuse me, we looked at Isaac as a picture of the sacrifice of the Messiah of the Christ. We saw how Isaac in his journey with his father Abraham to Mount Moriah is a wonderful and a stark portrayal of the sacrifice of a father of his son. And what a beautiful picture it was indeed. I have chosen to point out four men in this passage in chapter 1, Isaac being the first. Tonight we'll look at Judah. Isaac was a picture of the sacrifice. Judah is a picture of the substitute of the Christ. How he would substitute himself for his people. And next week we'll look at Boaz, 
who is the Redeemer. He speaks about how Jesus is the Redeemer. We see Boaz in his redemptive story with Ruth, how he redeems her and her possessions and her family and all that belongs to her. And now he's a wonderful picture of Jesus as our Redeemer. And then the week after that, we'll look at David, the shepherd king. Jesus, of course, is called the son of David. Even here in chapter 1 and verse 1, this is the history of Jesus Christ, the son of David. And so we'll look at these four men as prophetic pictures of who and what the Messiah would be. Now we look at the story of Judah, and I think what strikes me about Judah is, is what a foolish man he was. You can read about his foolishness in chapter 37 of the book of Genesis, where he recommends that one of his brothers be sold into slavery. You can read about his foolishness in Genesis chapter 38, where he is caught up in a sordid tale. This man was not a wise man, and yet he is in the line of the Christ. He is in the family of Jesus. And in that way, he quickly, before we get into more depth of his story, he quickly reminds me of my place in, in God's family. Paul the Apostle said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, God has chosen the foolish things. Yes, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. And the whole point is that no flesh should ever glory in his presence. And so Judah has a place in the messianic line, and yet he's a mess of a man. And yet God uses this messy man, this foolish individual, to present to us one of the most beautiful pictures of Christ in the Old Testament. And that gives me great hope. Perhaps in this fool, or perhaps some fool in the pew, <laughs> God can use us in a wonderful way. No matter the places that we have fallen and stumbled and totally blew it, done the wrong thing, totally misrepresented Christ, was a totally bad testimony for the Christian life, for God, for His Son, and yet the Lord still chooses to use us, to use the foolish things. And He did just that with Judah. Now, Judah was involved in a very intriguing story, a mysterious story. One day, his youngest brother was summoned by the prime minister of Egypt. He was summoned to personally meet the prime minister of the world power of the day. Judah's youngest brother was Benjamin. And Judah was invited along with Benjamin and all of their brothers, 11 total, to a mysterious banquet that the prime minister was throwing. Now, in this family there was some distrust. And Jacob, the father, did not want his beloved youngest son, Benjamin, to go. But notice what happens. If you turn to Genesis, and if we look over here in chapter 44, I believe. I forgot to put a bookmark in here. 43. In chapter 43, in verse 9, he comforts his father and he says, I myself will be surety for him. I will be his insurance policy. You can entrust him to me. I'm not going to let anything happen to him. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. And so the father allows it. Okay, we need food. There's a great famine in the land. And for whatever reason, the prime minister of the world power of Egypt wants to see my boy. 
If that's what it takes to get us bread, go ahead and do it. All of you boys go, take Benjamin with you. But at this banquet, from beginning to end, it was mysterious. As the brothers are seated, separated from the Egyptians, the prime minister doesn't sit down with them. He sits over with his staff and has those brothers sit over there. But he has them seated according to their birth, from oldest to youngest. And more than that, Benjamin, the youngest, is given a portion five times greater than the rest of the brothers. And they begin to look around at each other, and they're astonished. How does this man know? Who, who told him the ages that are here represented? How does he know how to seat us? And during this banquet, as they look over at the prime minister, they can see that he's agitated. He's visibly emotional. He's disturbed. He seems upset. And at one point, the prime minister is seen to excuse himself. And the brothers wonder what's going on. They're, they're concerned about this. Well, finally the brothers are sent on their way with their bags of grain and such. And as they're on their way home, certainly talking about this strange banquet, they are stopped by the head of security of the prime minister. And they're accused of theft. Hey, don't you know the prime minister, he also was a diviner and somebody has stolen his diviner's cup. We have not done such a thing. Judah stands out. No way. You can search every single bag here. I know that not one of my brothers would be guilty of such a thing. In fact, if you find that cup in any person's bag, he'll be executed. No problem. That's how confident Judah was. Steps forward. Confident. We are innocent of these charges. And the cup is found in Benjamin's bag. Judah's heart sinks. He remembers his vow to his father. He was so certain that he could deliver Benjamin safely once again. And now Benjamin's being arrested by the head of security. Now at his own words, Benjamin is about to be executed. And so they go before the prime minister. And Judah, this foolish man. Judah, this man who so quickly put his foot right in his mouth. Judah steps forward and he asks to speak directly with the Prime Minister. And he explains the love of the Father for Benjamin. He explains the vow that he had made. He explains that this would kill his father. This would cause his father to be broken. And in verse 33 of chapter 44, he tells the prime minister, Now therefore, please, let your servant, let me, remain instead of the boy, instead of Benjamin, as a slave to my Lord, and let the boy go up with his brothers. And suddenly, the prime minister of the world power of Egypt he begins to convulse with tears. And he hollers out to all of his staff, to all of those who serve him, to all of his cabinet, leave me! And the prime minister is left there alone with the brothers. And he says, it's me. Perhaps for the first time he speaks to them in Hebrew. It's Joseph. It's Joseph. It's me. You see, when Judah stepped forward to intercede for Benjamin, Joseph's heart was broken for his brothers. I can only imagine the bitterness that Joseph had against his brothers. It was Judah himself who said, let's sell this boy to the Midianites who were passing by. It was Judah who came up with that plan. It was Judah's word that sent Joseph to slavery in Egypt. And Joseph's life was up and down. He found himself hired by Potiphar. And that seemed to go great. 
And then he was accused of rape, found himself in jail, where he spent, seems to me, over a decade. I'm not sure exactly how long. Perhaps near 20 years. We're not told. But it was a long time. And finally, through a sequence of events that we won't go through here, he was brought up out of the prison by the Pharaoh himself and elevated to be the prime minister and to save Egypt from the famine, to, to manage how the farmers would perform the agriculture because there was a prophecy, you might recall, of the seven good years of plenty and the seven years of famine. And so Joseph was put in charge of managing the famine that would come. And he did an excellent job, we are told. And then one day he sees his brothers come for food. They don't know it's him. He, he looks like an Egyptian. He speaks the language of Egypt. They could not even imagine that this would be Joseph. You couldn't even believe it if somebody told you that. And so through another sequence of events, he finally requests that Ben, in fact, he commands it. You won't see my face again unless Benjamin comes with you. And so Judah stands before him, this man who at once condemned him, and now he intercedes for Benjamin. And there's something a little deeper there, a little more. Benjamin and Joseph were the two youngest sons of Jacob, and they were the only two children. They were full brothers. They were the only two children from Rachel whom was the favored wife of Jacob, whom he loved. Remember, it was for Rachel that he worked all those years for Laban. He was given Leah and her handmaiden through deceit, as you might recall. But it was Rachel whom he loved. It was Rachel whom he worked for. But Rachel was barren for so many years. And finally, after many years, give me children or I die, Rachel said. And finally, the Lord opened her womb. And it did bring death to her. But she gave birth to Joseph, and then she gave birth to Benjamin. And as she was dying, she names Benjamin, Benoni, son of my sorrow. I won't see you grow. And she breathed her last. The father, moved by that scene, calls his son not Benoni, but Benjamin. This son who indeed has parted me from my wife, who has caused sorrow to her, he will be the son of my right hand. He will be the one that I lean on when I am old. He will be the one that I show great love to. And so he loved Benjamin. And Joseph, Joseph, Joseph loved Benjamin. He wasn't betrayed by Benjamin. He was betrayed by the ten older brothers. Benjamin was his truest brother and his full-blooded sibling. And Joseph's heart was broken when he saw the intercession of Judah, who said, let me take the place of this boy. And so Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. And they're shocked, and the older boys are horrified. Oh, he's going to take great vengeance on us for sure. But he says, oh no, oh no. And he shows them his love for them. And he speaks about his father. Tell me about my father. Is he still alive? And I want to see him too. Bring him up here. And he makes a place for his family in Egypt through this difficulty and through this famine. And so Judah, this man who could be so foolish, becomes a beautiful type and a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You see, this speaks to us of what we call the substitutionary atonement of Christ. You recall, I believe we have read it many times by now. You have probably accidentally memorized it even. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, the angel told another Joseph, <laughs> told Joseph, the husband of Mary, name this child Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. See, he will be a sacrifice, yes. But he will also be a substitute. He will intercede on their behalf. On behalf of their sins, he will take the penalty. He will take the brunt. 
He will bear their sins and he will save their people. We call it substitutionary atonement because we believe that Jesus Christ literally took our place on the cross of Calvary. That he didn't just bear sin in general. Perhaps the notion of the Catholics would strike to your mind. The, the notion of original sin is kind of dealt with, but you need to take care of any sins that come after Adam. Any of your own personal sins you've got to deal with, there's sacraments, uh, there's prayers, there's purgatory if you didn't have enough time on earth. See, we don't believe that. We believe that Jesus didn't die for simply original sin or sin in, in general, but that he substituted himself for your sins, for, for literally the sins of his people. Whatever sins we have committed, even though it's 2,000 years after the cross, our sins are accounted in some mysterious and eternal way to his account. It's as if he has stepped before the ruler of all the earth, just like Judah did, and said, please, let me take their place. As Judah asked to take Benjamin's place, and it was a specific place. Judah didn't just say, oh, let me take the place of any traitor. But it was, let me take his place. It was definite. It was very particular. It, it was, there was a, a very certain sin that was involved. Now, of course, Joseph had made it up and there was a framing involved. Uh, they found the cup in his bag because Joseph, I didn't mention, but you probably know the story. Joseph had had a place there. But Judah doesn't know that. All he knows is his dumb younger brother has the cup in his bag. That's all Judah knows. I'm sure Benjamin said, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. But Judah's the fourth oldest. Benjamin's the uh, twelfth of the brothers. And so probably Judah doesn't believe him. This little whippersnapper has got us all in trouble and he's gotten himself killed. I've called for his execution myself on accident. Oh, whoever you find that thing in, let him die. And so it was very particular. I'm taking the place of this boy of his sins. It was, very, it was very specific. And we are told that Christ has taken our very specific sins upon himself. Let me read uh, two great verses from 2 Corinthians. The first one is in chapter 5, verse 21. For he, God the Father, made him, Jesus the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And in chapter 8, verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sakes he became poor that you through his poverty might become rich. And a, a favorite verse in Galatians chapter 2, just a few pages over, the Apostle Paul declares in chapter 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. See, not my general sin, not, not some unknown, unnamed sin, not, not sin common, not sin in general, but I, my sins, have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live that, that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. And so we speak of the substitutionary atonement of Christ. Substitutionary because he stepped into our shoes. He took our cross upon himself. He was nailed to the tree for our sins. Call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. We had need of salvation. Sin had tracked us down and had <laughs> stomped on our heads. We were doomed. There was no way we could rescue ourselves or deliver ourselves. And sin had so consumed us 
so contaminated and polluted us, the Bible goes on to tell us in Romans 1 that we had become haters of God. We were suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. We were not seeking Him, but He came seeking us. And of course, atonement. Not a word used in the New Testament per se, but an Old Testament word. You remember how on the Day of Atonement, the priest would lay his hands and, and by figure attach all of the sins of the people to that lamb that would be slain. And then there was another lamb that would be the scapegoat. One lamb would be slain and another lamb would carry the sins by figure far away. Atonement. See, there's a problem. We're not reconciled. And to be reconciled, there must be atonement. There must be a propitiation is the New Testament word. That there must be some way that God's wrath can be quelled. That we can have peace with Him. How can we have peace with Him? And God reached down and made peace with us through the blood of His Son. Atonement. Propitiation. The sacrifice of Christ and the substitution of Christ in our place brought peace between us and God and made us family. We have been adopted. We are God's children in Jesus the Beloved. And so Judah is a wonderful picture of this substitutionary atonement that Jesus made for us. That he willingly stepped into our place and said, Father, let me take the place of these people that they might be spared, that they might be saved. And of course, as he hung on the cross, in confidence, even in agony, he cried out, it is finished. It's done. I have accomplished the will of my Father. I always in my life did that which pleased him. And the greatest pleasure that I ever brought him was the sacrifice and the substitution that I have made here on the cross. And it's done. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wonderful word, your words of life. We thank you for the wonderful picture that Judah gives to us of your beautiful and gracious son. Father, might we love your son ever more as the days go by. And Lord, as we think of Jesus, it's certain that we think of him as our redeemer. But tonight we desire to look at him as our great physician. And we lift up Nancy to you once more before we go. Our hearts are heavy with concern and we are anxious for her. And so, Lord, we offer up our prayer and our petition. Lord, give her peace, give her comfort. Lord, give her strength and healing. In Jesus' name we ask. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.